Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to this uh, training on uh, neural networks and deep learning. In the previous videos, uh, we have been building some concepts, uh, some basic concepts around uh, neural networks. We talked about uh, perceptrons, which are the most fundamental building blocks of uh, neural networks. And then we also discussed uh, how uh, a collection of perceptrons can be combined uh, to build uh, what is uh, conventionally called a feed-forward uh, neural network and uh, how it performs uh, decision-making. In this video, uh, we will talk about something uh, which is called an activation function and it's once again a concept uh, very fundamental and very basic uh, when it comes to neural networks. And uh, activation functions are, uh, are something which actually help uh, neural networks capture the non uh, linearity in the data so uh, from from that aspect also they, they are very important so get started in our discussions about activation function now uh, if you look at the way a perceptron neuron uh, performs it basically receives the inputs from different features uh, combines them uh, using a, a linear combination and then uh, throws out an output and then the output is either 1 or 0 uh, depending on whether the weighted uh, combination of the input features are more than a threshold value or if they are less than a threshold value. So we have seen this uh, concept in the previous video. So this is how a perceptron neuron performs. And this will its, itself form uh, the, the building block for the concept of activation functions as well. So uh, if we represent the perceptron neuron using uh, the concept of activation function, this is how it should look like. So uh, step one, what we should be doing is uh, we should be uh, calculating the, the weighted sum of the inputs, the input features that the neuron, the perceptron neuron is receiving. And then if we apply a function A, we are calling the function as A here on the weighted sum of the input features, such that A uh, has a functional form like this where A takes the value 1 if its argument is uh, positive and takes the value 0 if its uh, argument is negative or uh, 0. So essentially uh, the function A when applied on the weighted combination of the input features is actually doing the same task that the perceptron neuron was doing for me. So, so this function A actually uh, represents the uh, functioning of the percep perceptron neuron. And uh, this This is the concept of uh, activation function. So activation function essentially is a function applied on the weighted sum uh, of the inputs uh, to a neuron. So uh, one neuron uh, will receive inputs uh, from all the input features and uh, they are uh, combined uh, by, the, by certain weights and uh, what the perceptron neuron uh, typically does is it, it calculates the uh, linear combination and then compares it with a, a preset threshold value. So what activation function uh, will do is it will basically apply a function on the, the weighted combination of the input features and we saw that a particular form of the function uh, A actually uh, generates the perceptron neuron itself. Now however that is not the only form functional form of A uh, we will look at. There are many other uh, functional forms of A as well. So why are we introducing something uh, like an activation function? We are saying that uh, the output from every neuron will uh, not just be the weighted combination of the input features, but it will be some function of the weighted combination of the uh, input features and that function uh, we are calling as the activation function. The reason we are doing this uh, is, is not merely the fact that we want to make things mathematically more complex or we want to build something very elegant. There are uh, 
other more practical reasons for doing it which we will find out soon so going back to the uh, example uh, we started off with uh, on perceptron neuron if uh, a was the activation function for the perceptron neuron this is how it was functioning right so it was outputting a value 1 if uh, the argument and in this case the argument is nothing but the weighted combination of the input feature if that is positive vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, if it is negative or zero then the activation function is uh, outputting a value of zero so if i plot this activation function which is the perceptron activation function how does this function look like so uh, in the x-axis i am plotting the uh, the z values which is the weighted combination of the features and in the y-axis I'm plotting the value of the activation functions so obviously this looks like a, a discrete uh, step function and there is a, a step jump at uh, the point zero because uh, if z is positive then az is 1 and if z is 0 or negative then az is 0 so the perceptron activation function uh, looks like this whether or not it is good or bad uh, we will assess it but for now we can see that uh, even for the most basic form of neuron the perceptron neuron we can plot the activation function how about uh, having a linear activation function so uh, instead of having uh, a perceptron activation function which was more kind of an indicator function one zero uh, kind of a function let's say uh, we bring in little bit of more complexity and we say that uh, the activation function is linear and linear uh, of the form a plus b z where a and b are uh, weights or parameters and z is the weighted combination of the input features so a simple form but does it really work for us we will we will find out uh, soon uh, it doesn't work for us and why doesn't it work for us so so in each of the uh, neurons we are getting the output and the output is nothing but the, the the weighted combination of the input features and then on that output we are applying the activation function a and then uh, those inputs are subsequently going to the output layer and on the output layer again we are applying the activation function A. So this is typically how the activation function should be applied on the entire uh, network. Now here we are talking about how about a choice of A plus B Z, a linear form of the activation function and we'll see soon that it doesn't really work. So this is how the uh, structure of the feedforward neural network looks like and we have seen this structure in uh, in the previous video so the information from the input features are first passed on to the neurons in the first layer and they compute a weighted combination and then uh, they further pass on their inputs to the neurons in the second layer and so on and so forth and finally we have the signals uh, coming into the uh, terminal uh, layer of the uh, output neuron now think of it how are the neurons uh, combining the informations that they are receiving think of the first uh, hidden layer each neuron here is actually doing a linear combination of the input features that they are receiving and the linear combination is done using the weights right again in the second uh, layer the second hidden layer uh, these neurons are also doing a linear combination of inputs that they are receiving from the neurons of the pre previous layer so every neuron in a way is doing a linear combination of the inputs that they are receiving so if the activation function is also linear then what happens is uh, applying the activation function would actually mean applying a, a linear function on another linear function and it's very obvious that a composite of two linear functions will result into another linear function for that matter a composite composite of whatever number of linear fun functions it may be the output will again be a linear function so if we apply a linear activation function then even in the terminal node or the final neuron uh, all that we are doing is we are applying a linear combination on the input features which is something you know uh, similar to I would say uh, linear regression so essentially uh, 
the very objective of neural network uh, which uh, we were saying that we want to capture the complex relationship the non-linearity in the data that is not met with because uh, linear activations is actually linear activation function is actually rendering uh, into a scenario where uh, the composition of uh, all the linear functions together is also a linear function and hence uh, we are not actually doing a non-linear combination uh, of the input features we are doing a linear combination of the input features to arrive at the uh, the final decision which was not the objective so that is why a linear activation function even though it might sound as much appealing because of the simplicity doesn't work so what works let's uh, try and introduce something uh, which is called a sigmoid uh, activation function and a sigmoid activation function uh, has uh, the functional form like this 1 by 1 plus exponential of minus x and if we plot it then uh, this is how the plot looks like now a sigmoid activation function it's, it's a very common choice by the way and uh, there are uh, uh, there are some uh, very uh, uh, advantage advantageous features of using a sigmoid activation function and, and that's the reason why it is so popular so if you think about the advantages uh, the first and foremost advantage is you know it handles non-linearity so the problem that i was alluding to uh, when i was talking about the possibility of having a linear activation function is no more there so definitely this function a with this this kind of a functional form introduces non-linearity so it can uh, it, it attempts to capture the non-linear uh, structure in the data what else it also maps any value uh, to a range of 0 to 1 both 0 and 1 included so if you look at the uh, graph here of the sigmoid activation function you'll see that uh, w uh, whatever be the values of x uh, the function ax uh, has a, a range of uh, 0 to 1 so it, it's a bounded function and uh, there is another advantage so uh, and, and if we use this uh, function in the terminal uh, node or the terminal neuron of the uh, neural network the output layer then what happens is whatever input the output layer is receiving from the hidden layers it will map it to a range of 0 to 1 right and and it's bounded and what the uh, the benefit that it gives us is you know in most cases where uh, we are trying to arrive at any decision we can uh, we, it, it helps to know the the probability of uh, the event happening or the probability of the event not happening and uh, even though uh, the sigmoid activation function what it gives is not a probability but because of the value being in the range 0 to 1 it looks like a probability and gives a sort of some sort of comfort level to a lot of people but uh, never mistake this as a probability by the way and and it's a smooth function so this is where uh, uh, we will have to sort of park uh, some of our discussion for the next video when we talk about uh, gradient descent because uh, that is where we will uh, realize that what are the advantages of having a smooth uh, activation function in terms of the disadvantage of sigmoid uh, even though it is uh, very popular but one of the disadvantages if you look at uh, the nature of the function beyond uh, the range minus 2 and plus 2 you will see that the function uh, really flattens out and which means the derivatives are very small outside the range of minus 2 to plus 2 if you, if you do a derivative of this function it is very uh, obvious that uh, below minus 2 and above plus 2 the derivatives become very small the tangents uh, become almost uh, parallel to the x-axis right and uh, that is a disadvantage once again why it is a disadvantage we'll have to park that discussion uh, for the next video uh, next set of videos where we talk about uh, radian descent so so that was the sigmoid activation function uh, immensely popular some of the features perspective but then uh, there are some uh, differences as well so this is how the the tan hyperbolic activation function looks like so much like the sigmoid function it also looks like a, a sort of a s 
shaped curve you know, though the sigmoid one was more of a elongated is uh, than this one and uh, in terms of the advantages once again uh, it handles linearity uh, sorry it handles non-linearity fairly easily because uh, the function itself is non-linear and it introduces a non-linearity to the neural network and uh, it is bounded so uh, unlike sigmoid where the bound was 0 and 1 here the bound is minus 1 to plus 1 and uh, it's a, and the derivatives are larger uh, it, it, has, it has a steeper slope than sigmoid so uh, just by looking at the shape of the 10h function it would be very evident that the slope would be steeper uh, than uh, the sigmoid function and uh, obviously if the, if the slope is steeper then the derivative will, will be larger and again the benefits of having larger derivatives uh, uh, the discussion around that will have to be parked uh, when we talk about uh, gradient descent. In terms of uh, the disadvantage, again, it's the same disadvantage as we uh, saw uh, in case of sigmoid, that if you go outside the range of minus 2 and plus 2, uh, then uh, the derivatives become small, uh, the tangents of this curve become almost uh, parallel to x-axis. Again, that's a disadvantage because uh, from uh, neural networks uh, activation per function perspective, we want their derivatives to be large rather than small. Uh, and that uh, really helps uh, in uh, some of the purposes which we will discuss uh, in the subsequent videos. The third kind of uh, activation function uh, that we have uh, is again this is very popular these days it's called uh, the ReLU activation function and it's quite different uh, compared to sigmoid and tan hyperbolic so what it does is it basically uh, it can be written as the maximum of zero and z z is the input that the activation function receives so anything which is less than zero which is anything which is negative is actually capped at zero and anything which is positive is retained. So uh, another way of interpreting this activation function is if you apply this activation function on any neuron then if the input which that neuron is receiving and, and recall uh, that the input received by a neuron is nothing but the linear combination of uh, the features uh, from the preceding layer. So if the input to a neuron is negative then what this activation function does is it basically makes that neuron irrelevant it, it makes it zero however if the input to the neuron is positive then the positive value is retained so again this is a non-linear function so it can handle non-linearity and it is a it is a great advantage uh, and that is why uh, i'll talk about that advantage and this is that advantage which makes this uh, activation function so popular these days so what it does is it makes uh, the computation of the uh, neural network far less demanding compared to sigmoid or tan h activation function why that happens because you see uh, there is always a chance that a neuron will become irrelevant uh, in the network and when will that happen when the input that neuron is receiving is negative and how does that help computation these days you know uh, with uh, with the advent of uh, more and more computing power uh, cloud computing and all those kind of stuff people are uh, using very very dense and deep neural nets so they're using lots of hidden layers and you know, and, and using uh, brute force computing to actually do the decision making now as many uh, layers that you introduce it introduces that many weights uh, or parameters into the neural network as well right which means you have to do uh, that much of computation that much of uh, parameter estimation so in such a scenario if certain neurons are switched off uh, whenever the value uh, the neuron is receiving is negative it, it speeds up the computation because even though 
you ha let's say if you have a total of 100 neurons uh, distributed across uh, 10 layers each layer having 10 neurons each then um, if you use a relu activation function then even though you have 100 neurons in certain at certain steps of the computation process you will see a far less number of neurons as active because all those neurons which are receiving negative signal at a certain stage uh, will become deactivated. So that is the advantage uh, which the ReLU activation function brings in. It makes the computation of the neural network, the parameter estimation process uh, far less demanding than using sigmoid and tan -H. And that is why, uh, particularly in the context of deep learning these days where people use a lot of hidden layers, uh, ReLU has become uh, really, really popular. Uh, ReLU also helps uh, in, in a way uh, to do something which is called a regularization of uh, neural networks. But again, we will park uh, that uh, discussion for the video uh, where we talk about regularization in a more dedicated way. So, uh, sigmoid, tan -H, and ReLU, these are the three most uh, commonly used activation functions in the context of neural networks. Uh, my suggestion would be if you are not using too many uh, hidden layers, if it is just one or two hidden layers that you are using, you can uh, play around with uh, either uh, tan -H or sigmoid. Doesn't make sense to use ReLU if you are not using too many neurons in your network. But if your problem demands using a lot of hidden layers, and, and essentially that would mean using a lot of neurons, there I would suggest you can use ReLU as the activation function in the, uh, in the, in the hidden layer neurons. However, for the neuron in the output layer, uh, which is the final neuron, you can still uh, use uh, tan H or sigmoid as the activation function. And uh, a point to be noted here is uh, when you're constructing neural networks, the activation function that you use uh, for, the, for the hidden layers, uh, intermediate neurons, can be different from the activation function that you use uh, in the output layer of the final neuron. So that, that flexibility is there. Most of the uh, libraries, the machine learning libraries, be it in R, be it in Python, which implements uh, neural networks gives this flexibility. So you, you're completely free to use that as well. So um, that was the discussion around activation function. Before we close this discussion, we will have a little bit of a fun fact, look at a fun fact. So. Uh, all of us, if not all of us, most of us uh, would have uh, heard of or used logistic regression at some point of time, right? And and this is what the functional form of logistic regression looks like. So we have a uh, we we have a log of p by one minus p, and that is written as a as a weighted uh, linear combination of the input features. That is how the logistic regression equation looks like. Now, for a moment think about the single perceptron neuron structure. So let's say you have the input features, which are all feeding in their signals uh, to the perceptron, uh, not the perceptron, uh, the neuron here. So this is not the perceptron neuron, but this is uh, any generic neuron. So these input features are uh, giving in their information to this neuron. And what this neuron is doing is step one, it is calculating a weighted combination of the input features. And then it is applying an activation function on that same concept, which we discussed uh, in some of the previous examples. But let's say this activation function A has a form like this, e power z by 1 plus e power z, where z is nothing but the uh, weighted linear combination of the input features. It's very evident that if we choose the activation function A to be having a form like this, we can actually represent logistic regression as a neural network. A neural network which will have a single neuron, all the input features linked to it, and that single neuron will have an activation function of that form. So 
this is just a fun fact I wanted to bring it up so it, this is by no means to say that you know a logistic regression something as simple as that is actually doing uh, something as complex as neural networks but from a, a mathematical interpretation perspective or math more, more of a representation perspective you can also represent the uh, equation of a logistic regression as a single neuron uh, neural network where the activation function has this specific form. So I thought I'll just end with that fun fact uh, that brings us uh, to the end of our discussion on activation function. We have parked a few concepts uh, related to activation function which we will discuss when we again uh, talk about a gradient descent uh, and how a gradient descent is used in the context of neural networks. Thank you and uh, stay tuned for the next videos. Bye.